Pavel welcoming you to NBA Vault. And this week, we're going to bring you some history of the Milwaukee Bucks, not just through the old films and the archives, but through the eyes of a man who saw it all for himself. He was the longtime voice of the Milwaukee Bucks and ranks as one of the greatest play-by-play -play men in NBA history. Eddie Doucette joins us along with Peter Vesey and Gail Goodrich. Legends in the house, a legendary player, a legendary broadcaster, and a legendary writer. This is going to be fun. I've, I, you know, I always had this dream about uh -oh. maybe one day waking up in a vault surrounded by money. And you know what? The, the dream has come true. I mean, I wake up in the vault and I'm surrounded by money. <laughs> These guys are money and they don't even know it. By, when he shot, he was money. <laughs> by the end of the program, you got to have nicknames for all of us. Oh. That's, that's, that's part of it, you know? You won't be mad at me, huh? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Go low with those nicknames. That's the way we like oh, it. Man. Hey, it was back in 1968 that the Bucks entered the NBA as an expansion team. Now, they struggled through their first season, as you might expect, winning just 27 games. But all it took to turn things around was one little stroke of good luck. Spring 1969 and the future of two teams hinged on a coin flip. The coin has come up pale. <laughs> And so, in their second year of existence, the expansion Milwaukee Bucks acquired the draft rights to Lou Alcindor, likening him to Chamberlain. Experts predicted that he would transform the young Bucks into instant contenders. He did not disappoint. Averaging 29 points a game, he would lead Milwaukee to a 56-win season. The following year, legendary guard Oscar Robertson would join the team in a trade that would send expectations soaring. I joined the Bucks. I knew we were going to win the championship that year. As soon as I got there. Destiny. Confidence. I just knew we were going to win. Well, when I heard that, that Oscar was coming to, to play with the Bucks, I, I was very happy. I thought that really made it easy for us to win because of his abilities at both ends of the court. Getting to work with him every day really helped me see uh, his greatness. With the Big O controlling the game from the perimeter and Big Lou unstoppable down low. To the middle of the road. He's got it inside of Unsell. He stops the ball. Two more. The Bucks laid waste to the rest of the NBA, compiling a league best 66 and 16 record. Steamrolling to the conference finals, the Bucks reached a much anticipated confrontation with Will Chamberlain's Lakers. It proved to be no contest. Boozer dumps it low left to Lou. He's got the ball in the hand about waist, waist high. He turns right hand hook and then! Al Cinder and his Bucks romped to a decisive five game victory that left no one unconvinced. Well, I, I think they, they had all the parts. You know, when you, uh, when you have an Oscar Robinson and a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that's a nice duo to build around. Unseld would witness this duo at its devastating best, crushing his bullets four games to none. The Bucks would become only the second team in history to sweep the finals. In three short years, they had gone from expansion team to one of the NBA's greatest champions. Down low left side from Oscar Lou. Great snake. Lou slams it through. He turned back to his right, then came back to his left and jammed it down. What an effort they have given Oscar Robertson, Lou Alcindor. What a year it has been. The Bucks are the world's champions. No expansion team in any sport ever won a championship faster than those Milwaukee Bucks who captured the crown in just their third year of existence. Now, Eddie, you were there as the Bucks broadcaster right from day one. And what did it mean for the franchise to win that coin flip and gain Lou Alcindor? It meant everything. Uh, because this, this was a team that could have been, I mean, the Phoenix Club, I think that first year won 15 games. 16, come 16? on. 16? <laughs> it was a break. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry about that, Goody. It was a, uh, it was a very it was sad year, you're right. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Bucks won 27 games. I mean, they've had years since 1990 where they haven't won 25 games. So the franchise could have very easily labored in anonymity for quite a while, like Phoenix did for a while. You were in the room. <laughs> Uh, when the Milwaukee Bucks got the good news about the coin flip, Gail was in the other room when Jerry Colangelo got the bad news. That's unbelievable that you two guys are both here. You were both a part of that history. Yeah, it, it was it was a very sad day in Phoenix, obviously, yeah. because uh, Kareem or you know Alcindor at the time, I mean he he was really. Uh, 
and probably still today, is, is arguably the, the, the most skilled center to ever play the game. I mean, offensively, is unbelievable. And, and that was no surprise. So by getting Alcindor, uh, I mean, he just turned things around. And Phoenix, you know, we were just, I mean, just hoping and hoping uh, to, to, to get uh, Kareem. Kareem, you know, or Alcindor, uh, I saw him in the seventh grade come to my high school to try out for a scholarship, Archbishop Malloy, St. Jude's. He came in with a team when I was a senior in high right. school. He might have been in eighth grade. And uh, that's the first time I ever saw him. When I'm watching this film, I, I had forgotten how great he was. Oh, I'm serious. No, because no, I remember him at the end of his career. I, that, that stuff, is, I mean, he was pretty good. Oh, there was no <laughs> better. I mean, it was unbelievable. What he, what he was, even more than that, and of all the guys in my career, that I've had a chance to interview in all the sports that I've been able to do, he was the most intelligent athlete of all of them. Hmm. I mean, to a point where almost it was a fault of his because if you'd ask a question, he would just bore holes in that question to make sure that it was something worthy of what he was in terms of his <laughs> skill level. That's why we were scared to ask him questions. <laughs> well, he, he was definitely a tough interview, but uh, when you got him, he gave you great stuff. And we're coming back with more great stuff. we got to take a break here. We're coming back with much more on the Bucks with their legendary broadcaster, Eddie Doucette. Stay with us. Welcome back to NBA Vault. During a career that began in Milwaukee and ended in Los Angeles, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar left behind an incredible list of accomplishments. When you look at the numbers, they're staggering. 19-time All-Star, nobody else close. Six-time league MVP, six-time NBA champion. And along the way, Kareem used his trademark skyhook to become the leading scorer in NBA history. Magic right side, Kareem post up. They go to Kareem. Kareem backs in. Hook shot. It's up. Let's go. Let's go. The all-time leading scorer in the history of professional basketball, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, to me, was the greatest player to ever play professional basketball. Traditionally, a center was post-up, robotic, catch it, pass, pick. Uh, and don't go outside of about eight feet. Kareem came in, and he could shoot a sky hook <laughs> from, from 10 feet out. Kareem was one of the most beautiful players I've ever watched in my life. He had grace, he had style. He had the greatest shot that the game has ever seen. I have never seen a, an offensive weapon in any sport like that sky hook. And that sky hook was just poetry in motion. See, when he get down real low, that means he's mad. He's going to score 30 or 40 tonight. Now, when he stands straight up, he might only give you 25. But if he's down low, you're going to get 40. <laughs> it didn't matter if you had three guys on him. The whole team counted two points. So beautiful. Selected number one by Milwaukee in 1969, Alcindor quickly achieved NBA stardom. He led the Bucks to the title in 1971 in just their third season of existence. He had established himself as the game's best young player, yet Alcindor, preferring solitude, shied away from the spotlight. America is about individuals, and I just did not come from the same mold as most individuals in this, in this country, and uh, that was considered uh, in various ways at that time, sometimes with alarm. I remember uh, reading No Man is an Island, but Kareem gave it a shot. <laughs> that kind of summed me up in, in those days. After joining the Lakers, Kareem, like everyone else, was overwhelmed by the arrival of Magic Johnson in 1979. Led by Magic's infectious enthusiasm and Kareem's stoic pragmatism, the Lakers created Showtime, demolishing opponents with their vaunted fast break. Our whole goal was to run you into the ground. And the big fella be down court just waving it. Okay, whenever y'all can't get a basket, then call me down. <laughs> With Magic running the break and Kareem manning the middle, the Lakers won five NBA championships during the 1980s. And in the process, they helped Abdul-Jabbar find inner peace. 
It's funny, the, the last 10 years were, were much better than the first 10 years because uh, we, we were enjoying some professional success. That deflected a lot of criticism and in turn made it easier for me to smile and, uh, you know, fit in. <laughs> Absolutely one of the best of all time, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Eddie, you actually coined the term skyhook. Uh, how did that come about? And wow, that's unbelievable. one of the most famous terms in NBA history, and you coined it. Yeah, and, and if you remember the old Boston Garden, the, uh, the broadcasters used to broadcast from the first balcony. Right. And you really hung over the floor. And uh, we, we went there in that 74 series against the Celtics, and the Bucks went to seven games. They lose. That was the series that uh, Boston won uh, three games in Milwaukee. And uh, on that particular night in game six, Milwaukee forces it to a double overtime. And uh, I'll never forget it, that Kareem coming to the right baseline over high Henry Finkel. We all remember Henry, don't we? Yes, we do. Well, and, absolutely. And, and, up, and up he goes, about halfway up that baseline with that. And, it, and I looked out, and I'm doing the game, and it was almost as if I, I could reach out and touch him. And I said, that, that, that shot's coming out of the sky. It's a sky hook. Nice. And, yeah. that's, and, that, and it happened spontaneously just like that. I mean, obviously, merging Oscar Robertson with, with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, one of the top dynamic duos in the history of the NBA, if not the top dynamic duo. The reason why Oscar came, and you may, may remember this, uh, to Milwaukee was because there was a lot of discussion about maybe New York or maybe L.A., the two big cities. But he wanted a win because he hadn't won the big one down in Cincinnati. And he figured his best shot was with a young, uh, dynamic center, the guy that was a dynasty player in Kareem. So he signed on with Milwaukee, and that was it. First year he was there. Now, I don't, I, I can honestly tell you this. This is a tribute to Oscar Robertson. I don't know that Milwaukee ever wins it without Oscar Robertson. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, great. he's I mean, he puts, he puts them over the top. I yeah. mean, Kareem I mean, never would have taken them single-handedly to the top. I, I don't think so, no. Because okay. you had to have more than just one. And when you get Oscar, then that, you know, like you said, you get the two. And, of course, then they had Bobby Dandridge and a yeah. few others. But with uh, uh, Kareem, you know, in the middle and Oscar at, at, the, at the guard position, I mean, you have two of the greatest players. You can, you can look at uh, at at, at, uh, at their position uh, in that ever played. Yeah. Look at it a different way. Also, when he went to L.A., you know, Magic would Magic. would Magic have ever won a championship without Kareem, and vice versa. Right. Neither and, one yeah, of them. Right. Well, you know, when Kareem went to L.A., he, they, they had me, but that wasn't enough. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we had to wait for Magic. We had to wait for Magic to get there. <laughs> nice, Gail. I like that. Well, you know, Gail, 72 Lakers got it done, and the 71 Bucks got it done. And we're coming back to talk more about the 71 Bucks. They swept their way to the NBA title against Fred Carter's Bullets. That story and more coming up next. After rampaging through the regular season, the 71 Bucks continue to dominate in the playoffs. They dispatched the Warriors and Lakers in five games each, earning a trip to the finals against the Baltimore Bullets. Now, Oscar Robertson finally had his chance at a championship, and he wasn't about to let this one slip away. Here's a recap of that series, written and narrated by Eddie Doucette. <laughs> The Big O knew that he had to show the way. And did to start the Bucks rolling in game one. The Bullets' chances were dim when all pro forward Gus Johnson's ailing knees did not respond. He wasn't able to play, so the burden of performance fell on Burley Wes Unseld and the fabulous Earl Monroe. Sindor got in first quarter foul trouble and sat down. But Dandridge filled the void nicely. After playing only nine minutes in the first half, King Lou came back to score 18 points in the third and finished with 31 points as the Bucks won it 98 to 88. Coach Costello's pep talks couldn't have said it any better. Baltimore turned out big to see if their bullets could come back. Lou and Oscar were tough as always and totaled 49 points, 
30 rebounds and 12 assists between them. The Bucks 102, Baltimore 83. Let's go home for game number three. A determined Baltimore bunch did everything they could in this one to get a win. The strain of the last game kept Gus Johnson away again. And the big Milwaukee trio of Dandridge, Lou, and Oscar dug the trench a little deeper. Oscar was everywhere. He finished this one with 20 points. And now, in three games, had 64 points, 29 assists. It seemed he was making a habit of humiliating Baltimore's guards. Particularly, Fred Carter. Lou ended with 23 points and 21 rebounds. And the Greyhound was high scorer with 29 points. The Bucks win it 107-99. And Baltimore, a high-powered offensive team, had yet to go over 100 points against Milwaukee's solid defense. Now the big question was, could the Bucks win it in four and become the second team in league history to do so? Back to Baltimore to find out. Friday, April 30th, and a pessimistic cloud hung over Baltimore Civic Center. But they couldn't stop the big O as he continued to taunt Fred Carter. had a day hitting 11 of 15 floor shots, 8 of 9 free throws, had 9 assists, and drained the hopes of this crowd. And then there was the big guy as he drilled for oil with a couple of these. And then more of Oscar's 30 points. He was absolutely everything you could possibly want on a basketball court, averaging over 9 assists, 23 points, and 52% from the floor against the Bullets in this series. The Bullets knew their chances for glory were over. Lou winds up and finds Dandridge, who had 21 points, 12 rebounds, and 6 assists. Woe is me. Al Sindor hit a series average of 27 points in this game. As the playoffs' most valuable player, the King showed why, shooting over 61% and averaging more than 18 rebounds a game against the Bullets. Until he gets it back, two, one, he hits it. It's over! It's over! The Milwaukee Bucks are champions of the world! The Milwaukee Bucks are the world's champions! Every member of this team had a part to play, and they did it to perfection. Few now doubted how strong the new world's champs really were. The Bucks rolled over Baltimore in four straight and became only the second team in NBA history to do so in the championship round. I mean, it's all good for the Bucks, but our colleague, Fred Carter, wow, that might have been the worst highlight rip of all time in terms of him. Now, guys, uh, head coach Larry Costello uh, did an unbelievable job, obviously. I want to bring him into the conversation. Your thoughts on Costello? Wonderful coach. I don't ever think that anybody gave him enough credit for being able to uh, put together an offense to really uh, focus on this man's ability. Kareem is who I'm talking about. But you know what? Never got the credit he deserved. It was all about Kareem and Oscar. Deservedly so. But Larry Costello was the guy that put it all together. Yeah, he was the architect. He, uh, he, he, was, he was amazing for his time. Really well organized. Really knew the game. Understood fundamentals. Understood when players were doing and not doing what they were supposed to do. Uh, I Eddie, have the utmost of admiration Eddie, for Eddie, give, give, give props to those other guys on that team, though. They had five guys, Oscar, obviously, <coughs> Kareem, Greg Smith, John McLaughlin, and the last one, Bobby Dandridge. Five guys shot over 50% in that year. They wow. were five of the top 11 in the league. Wow. Like, yes, Talk about Dandridge, first Absolutely. of all. Absolutely. Magnificent player. Uh, I don't think uh, a lot of people got a chance to see Bob Dandridge, but Bob Dandridge knew how to play. And Oscar Robertson personally took uh, uh, Bobby Dandridge under his wing and made it possible for him to get to the right spots on the floor to deliver him the ball when he should deliver it so he could make the play. Bob Dandridge on that team averaged 18 and a half points a game. 
He uh, shot over 50 percent. That's with Oscar Robertson and Lou Alcindor. McLaughlin shot just under 16 a game. Were you surprised that, that the Bucks won that championship based on your perception at the beginning of the year to the end? I wasn't. I mean, I, you know, I played against that team, and they beat us 4-1 in the playoffs. And, uh, but that was a team that absolutely, I mean, they shot over 50% for a team. I mean, they yeah, had for, great for a, team. for a team. I mean, they had great, great shooters. Uh, and in addition to that, it was really, I thought, the first team that really played a little bit of what we call now team defense. Mm -hmm, I right. mean, as we saw in the film clips, it was really just one-on-one -on -one basic play. But you really had a very, very good defensive team. Let me, jump, let me jump in, though. In New York, we felt here that the Knicks, the Knicks could have beaten that team. I think everybody felt that uh, the Bullets, who only were 42 and 40, I believe, that year, right got swept. The Knicks had won, what, 63 games or something? Yeah. And the Bucks couldn't beat the Knicks at the Garden. That was like the Bullets championship series against the Knicks when they beat them. Had no gas left. Nothing yeah. left. And, and they were you, hurt. And you they talk about defense. The Knicks that year, I think they gave up 105 points a game. They were number one in the NBA. Though That was back in the day when they scored points. The Bucks were number two at giving up points at, I think it was 105-4. Mm -hmm. Let's make so, sure of it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> right. Let me get down here. Again. <laughs> 105 points a game, one of the best defensive teams in the league. Wow, different eras. And we're coming back with one more segment here, talking about the 1971 Milwaukee Bucks with Eddie Doucette. We're coming back with more of all after this. <laughs> Welcome back. As we remember the 70-71 Milwaukee Bucks, and where would you rank that team among the greatest of all time? Eddie, we'll start with you. Then, Peter, I want your thoughts. Well, I mean, obviously, you're coming to me. i having been there. And been you're wearing a, a ring that. from that team championship, uh, right? Uh, you know, I, I will defer to what uh, some some people today would call the uh, experts. And uh, <laughs> when I start, he when said I start, facetiously. Yeah, as he said facetiously. <laughs> when I start putting the numbers together, one fellow, he, he, in fact, he wrote a book called From Top to Bottom, and he analyzed all the teams up to this year, and he had that 1971 Bucks team number one in terms of dominance. When they compare all the statistics, and you know that that, that can get to be a pretty finite thing. I don't quite understand all of that, but you know. Games won, games lost, points scored, points allowed. And then you compare it against people that that would be the standard, so supposedly. Compare it against other people or other teams that would play during that era with a, with a, a comparable amount of wins. The Bucks in, in, in 71, they were a dominant team. They were a great team. Uh, and uh, little I mean, weak, we little be. weak in play by play. <laughs> oh wow, wow! And, and in that, and in that title defense, the Bucks snapped the 33-game winning streak for your Lakers, and one of the best play-by-play -play men of all time called the games for those legendary Buck teams. Eddie Doucette, it's been a pleasure having you here on the Vault. Hey Rick, thanks so much. I, I really enjoyed it. It was, you know, really hard to beat games back in that era. Even though we see great games today. But you go to the Garden, you go to Boston Garden, you go to the Chicago Stadium, yeah. uh, you know, the wow. fabulous forum. Wow. That was an era of basketball that I treasure. And we relive it each and every week here on NBA Vault. So for Gail Goodrich, Eddie Doucette, and Peter Vesey, I'm Rick Campbell. It, hates, it, it, it pains me to do this, but we're out of time. We're going to see you next week. This is NBA Vault. We'll see you soon, everybody.